Hi there, and welcome to episode 105 of Fate of a Black Planet. Um, I'm going to read something that I got printed this week in Spiked Online. Um, I can't remember, did I talk about Spiked Online and how they got, and how George Monbiot went after them? I think I did at the time, a few months back, and it was really depressing because George Monbiot when I started out as a news reporter, had been a really big hero of mine, and in many ways is still a model uh, when he's at his best, in terms of rigour and um, just a general sense of what a journalist should be, which is someone who holds very powerful people to account, regardless of who they are. But in recent years, I've often noticed that he's been someone who only... who who. The problem with the, the left I have at the moment is not that the, they want to hold right-wing governments to account or that they're worried about fascism or that they're all, all this sort of stuff, but they forget the sort of lesson of Orwell, basically, which is that the people who... It's too easy and too simplistic to reduce the world to oppressed and oppressor, that more often than not, as Orwell discovered, that the people who are oppressed can quite often turn out to be just as bad or even worse than the oppressor. And this is the whole problem, I think. I think this is really where the, the a, left, a, a, left, a left self-critique needs to start to happen. The, <clears throat> how you question why you are invested in this very simplistic conflict theory, this kind of bastardised reductive version of Marxism without any of the, any of the subtlety. And I've noticed that Monbiot, as well as many intellectuals on the left, have neglected to, to understand the, the, the gravity of that Orwellian lesson. And it seems to me that there's a reason for that, because it's, they're invested in it on a number of levels. But one of the main levels is that <clears throat> when you identify yourself as a voice for the underdog, uh, you don't want to question the people that you're a voice for because that would undermine the, the sort of meaningfulness that you find in that social role. And the shift that one makes after reading Orwell or one should make after reading Orwell is that rather than being a voice for the oppressed, you become a voice for truth. And no matter who's invested in shutting it down or no matter whose propaganda obscures that truth and that's a shift that a lot of left-wing journalists don't want to make and I understand it because they, you find a lot of meaning in your them versus us mentality but it's no different than people who want to shut down totally the borders and say that all foreigners are bad it's just the same simplicity and actually it's just the same level of objectification of the other <clears throat> and it's also a big hole in the sort of post-colonial critique where the only bad people are the white guys. Uh, as if no one other than white Europeans ever had an empire and ever had slaves and were ever brutal to their enemies. Or the post in the post-colonial world, no one other than the white man is, is perpetuating post-imperial violence. Um, <clears throat> so the uh, uh, anyway, getting back to Spike, the the kind of framework of the way that that Monbiot was looking at the world in order to come at Spike was really disillusioning to me because Spike is uh, isn't by no outlet is perfect, and and with very few outlets do I agree totally. One of the things I think that I probably uh, disagree with on the kind of spiked editorial position is it is actually quite materialistic. It is actually quite Marxist in its outlook in the sense that <clears throat> they're they, they, they equate social progress. It's sort of neoconservative if you're, or neoconservative Marxist or neo, neo-Marxist, let's put it like that, um, in the sense that they're against climate change activists because they feel that they're simplifying things to the point of 
regression in terms of economic progress for third world countries and things like that. It's that sort of take materialistic critique. <laughs> and I don't always agree with that, and I certainly am not. And also the, the, the cold culture war thing, they're very much in that and they're very much taking a front line stance on that. And in some ways that's to be admired actually, but I can't get on board with that anymore because the culture war is a, is a losing battle and actually it's distracting us from the, what I see as the main battle which is the crisis of the human soul uh, and that's kind of what this piece and, and I'm not sure whether actually I'm going to read my own version of it which is on my blog but I'll link to the spiked piece because the spiked piece they edited it down and they didn't necessarily change it in terms. They just edited it down to get a word count down, I think. But the, by editing it down, it kind of neutralised the 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 form of the which way I was writing it. And I'm not saying I'm you know uh, beyond critique as a writer at all by any stretch of the imagination. I'm a, I'm a you know uh, I ha I've had to work very hard to become at best decent writer. But it's. Um, the, nevertheless, that when I when I'm writing a kind of polemic like this, uh, the form in which I'm writing it, the, the a kind of um, maybe the irony doesn't come across. But when I'm writing, I, I can understand that maybe sometimes it's the same with people who criticise me as being pretentious in person. <laughs> uh, there is there is more than a dose of irony in it, and um, it's a it's it's a form of as if protest. It's a form of, I'm going to speak and act as if the world was my vision of an artistic, romantic place. And in, in, in full awareness that it's not that, and in full awareness that the world will never be like that, but that there is some benefit in posturing that way in a kind of Oscar Wilde fashion that... The, the posture is a form of spiritual protest, let's put it like that. And I feel that people don't get that. <clears throat> and that a lot of what I do on this podcast is the same. But let me just read what I wrote and we'll see how we get on. So if you want to go and have a read of it, it's at jamesblackfolk.com or you can go to the spiked one. This is called We Need a New Bohemianism. And the general thrust of it is that, <clears throat> so I, I mention it in the piece, but I was reading Churchill and Orwell, The Fight for Freedom, which is by Thomas E. Ricks, and it's this very interesting dual biography where he basically compares Churchill and Orwell as heroes of the 20th century who saved freedom, but in different ways and coming at it almost from completely different angles, obviously. Churchill was an avowed imperialist against Indian self-independence and um, Orwell was very pro-Britain uh, getting out of India and was very anti-colonialism and had experienced it firsthand and was disgusted with himself for taking part in it and in many ways many of his great works and Thomas E. Ricks talks about that Burmese days down out in Paris and London and uh, homage to Catalonia were, were ways of um, him punishing himself and, and trying to find absolution for his own participation in what he saw as just the willful cruelty and almost, how would you put it, Freudian delight in a sort of uh, paganistic control of the other, you know going way further than any of the post-colonial wankers today, incidentally. But, you know, I think he had a real... It seems from Briggs's book that Orwell had a real sense of the... the forces at play underneath colonialism. And Christopher Hitchens has talked about that as well. The, and I think it's absolutely right that, that Orwell had a kind of awareness of himself as a former Etonian middle-class writer of the forces that were at play in his own psyche and his own sense of entitlement and also his own sense of disgust <clears throat> and Ricks talks about Orwell's constant coming back to the sense of smell whether it's in Down and Out in Paris and London the smell of the kitchen or it's you know 
uh, the, the smell of um, uh, Indian people that are different from the whitey, you know, and, he, and he's understanding that his reaction in there is a sort of kind of what some people I suppose would call microaggression now, that there was a psychological disgust of the other inherent in that. And, that's a, and so in, but rather than blabbing on about it, like post-colonial writers now and all the whiteys in Brooklyn coffee shops whining about it, he, he was someone who realised his own entitlement and realised that his sort of gut reactions to certain people and things were a sign that he has to confront those things, which is why he went down the mines in Road to Wigan Pier, which is why he got a job as a scullion in, in a Paris restaurant. You know, he, 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 he used his sense of entitlement and disgust as a kind of uh, radar to guide him on where his next sort of journalistic mission is. And I think that that's quite interesting that comes across in Riggs' book, but also on some of the stuff that Christopher Hitchens has said backs that up. And I think it's true. I think that Orwell was quite self... With a lot of his ability to to be prescient and to, to be on the money about the questions of his day comes from a willingness to confront his own bullshit as a as a entitled white man who'd gone to Eton, um, and consequent, but consequent um, in conflict to that is Churchill, uh, someone who didn't do that. But at the same time, there are, there are many comparisons that come through the book, and I really recommend it. It's on Audible if you want to listen to it. Uh, there are some interesting comparisons in the sense that the, 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 Churchill was equally brave. Uh, he he and and and, and to, the, to an equal extent, <clears throat> actively sought out war and conflict on his own back, and didn't shy away from the issues of his day. And so you know, everyone makes a big thing about Gallipoli. But after Gallipoli, he yeah, and once he'd been thrown out of the cabinet or had resigned in shame from the cabinet, he went. He requested that he uh, get an officer's role in, on the front lines in the First World War. So he went to the front. And that's that. there's something very Orwellian in that, something, in, the, in the good sense. There's something very similar to the kind of muscular decisiveness. The, and, and, and so the, anyway, the, those kind of comparisons echo throughout the whole book and it actually shows that the, the, the sort of two, for all of Churchill's faults about colonialism, he was self-aware enough and was a Democrat enough to to understand the issues of his day and to to, um, to learn from his mistakes. And on Orwell's side, uh, he was self-aware enough about his own privilege that it guided him towards an, app- an, an apprehension of truth that his contemporaries were unable to access. So, very interesting book, and uh, and and that and those and those and those and I think one of the things about it is, is the individuality of the two men, the free thinking nature of the two men. I think is what was key to the fight for freedom against fascism and, and totalitarianism. And I think that that's I think that's why I like the book, and I think that got me thinking. Anyway, there was a pe- there was a there was a point in the book where he talks, Eric talks about 1984. And the, the, the sort of typical contrast between Huxley and on Orwell and uh, the typical rendition of that is that uh, Orwell was critiquing totalitarianism through the jackboot, that it was about force and um, physical power and the threat of violence, whereas Huxley was critiquing control and propaganda through the manipulation of the, pre- the, the humanity's instinct towards comfort and pleasure <clears throat> but Rick says that this is a false distinction because Orwell was completely aware of that and that comes across in 1984 and it got me thinking about that they understood that the threat of pleasure the, 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 the uh, you could neutralise dissent through pleasure the as Orwell says, that if, if, if humanity is given a choice between pleasure and freedom, they'll choose pleasure over freedom. And it kind of, that kind of describes our world now. Um, <clears throat> we have mistakenly, we mistakenly associate our prosperity and ability to 
to gratify our pleasure needs with freedom. And we, sometimes they are indeed the same thing, and it would be churlish to, to, to deny that we are more free than most people in the world. We live, it, those of us who have the opportunity to live in, in the West, quote-unquote. But at the same time, there is an element of slavery, and it got me thinking about bohemianism, which is something I talk about all the time on this podcast. And perhaps how... I've been feeling about the way bohemianism has been neutralised or has been appropriated by corporations and has been and has become actually a force for conformism and dogma rather than liberation. Whereas at one point the true bohemians were people who used pleasure and eroticism and creative self-expression as a means of genuine effective dissent whether they meant it or not it was they were revolutionary in the way that they demanded emancipation through the senses demanded the emancipation of the soul through the senses right and this is the uh, the, the distinction that I go into in this piece but anyway I'll read it and you can you can look at the piece I mean the the, the, the gist of it is the one, in, but I prefer my own one, so I'm going to read my own one. And it's on my blog. It's called We Need a New Bohemianism. Bohemianism, though hard to define, can be at least partly characterised as the fusion of radical creativity and sexual emancipation. Throughout history, this explosive blend of forces has generate, generated critical steps in social progress as artists and free thinkers sought to make their lives into works of art and to challenge the petty orthodoxies of their age. Today, however, self-expression and sexual freedom have become the engines of conformism. And as we see the mob tactics of trans, as we see in the mob tactics of trans activists, they are often the very instruments of repressive dogma. In the nineteen, in the early nineteenth century, the Romantic poet Percy Bysshe Shelley pioneered sexual freedom and opposed the state, stale, misogynistic rituals of, ma- of the ma- of marriage of his time. By pursuing a life of pagan spirituality, vegetarianism and free love, and travelling across Europe with his soulmate, the novelist Mary Shelley, he led the way for countless rebels and free spirits to come. The social impact of Shelley's visionary lifestyle is chronicled brilliantly in Daisy Hayes' fascinating books, The Young Romantics. Similarly, in Among the Bohemians, Virginia Nicholson examines how the Bloomsbury Group in the early 20th century also pursued a life of sensual, devoted to sensual freedom. In doing so, they challenged gender roles and stifled sexual politics and laid the groundwork for alternative lifestyle fashions that grace the pages of weekend supplements and women's magazines to this day. Radical pleasure-seeking was also at the heart of the Beat Generation, who built a literature around the idea of wild, ecstatic experiences and unshackled pursuit of sensual liberation. This movement found its manifesto in Allen Allen Ginsberg's Howl, which deploys outrageous imagery of gay sex and drug taking to articulate the fight of the modern the flight of the modern soul from the horrors of industrialization and America's suburban decay. Drawing from William Blake's visionary credo that the path of excess leads to the palace of wisdom, the counterculture of the 60s would follow on from the Romantics, Bloomsbury Bohemians and the Beats by using sexual license and hedonistic joy as a leverage for political and cultural change. We still live in the shadow of these bohemian breakthroughs. So it's a good thing, right? I'm I'm recognising that pleasure has been a genuine and not skin-deep or superficial weapon in progress and social emancipation. However, something has gone badly wrong. While pleasure and sexuality were once the wedge by which above the above movements forced social progress, today the pursuit of pleasure all too often becomes a form of addiction and self-enslavement, whether it is to brand consumerism, social media, online porn, or the dopamine overload of hashtag outrage. We are perpetually bombarded with temptations to follow through on our bodily desires. Sexuality is relentlessly imposed upon our psyches by media companies and advertisers that seek nothing but our captive attention and the secrets of our purchasing habits. Images of beautiful tattooed hipsters and curved bottom celebrities are the vehicles by which we are cajoled into giving up our personal agency for some province of pleasure and satisfaction. 
Even the very idea of rebellion itself is now a Trojan horse with a corporate marketing agenda. Think of Pepsi's ill-judged Kendall Jenner advert which sought to piggyback on social justice protest culture. Or more recently, Smirnoff's bid to sell drinks on the back of International Women's Day by sponsoring an equality in music campaign. Perhaps the most stark example of this dates back to 1984, with Steve Jobs' Super Bowl advert that used the motif of a youthful sportswear-clad woman smashing the image of George Orwell's big brother as a way to advertise the Mac personal computer. In his book Churchill and Orwell, The Fight for Freedom, Thomas E. Ricks notes that the typical debate around Aldous Huxley and George Orwell's respective dystopian visions focuses too narrowly on the way on which was the most prophetic writer. Rick says that the debate is based on a false antithesis. In fact, both writers understood the perilous way that pleasure could be used to manipulate people into compliance and standardised behaviour. As Orwell noted, if it's a choice between happiness and freedom, most human beings will choose happiness. The answer to to this annoying fact cannot be to resort to a kind of contrarian puritanism. This is a potential danger of the movement around Jordan B. Peterson and the rise of edgy YouTube conservatism. While such movements have a legitimate critique of the cultural consensus, the threat is that we will go back to a knee-jerk Victorianism or a 1950s culture of routine and stifled obedience. In the face of the insidious, pervasive, persuasive use of pleasure to enslave us to algorithms and vacuous, vacuous marketing brands, this would be a forgivable if regressive reaction. Inevitably, it too would ultimately mean a suppression of the individual. The answer is rather to claim, reclaim a more creative, self-reflective and discerning relationship to one's own senses and desires. Shelley's belief in the transformative power of sexual freedom and pleasure almost certainly came from his understanding of Plato. Being a brilliant classicist, he was one of the first people in modern Europe to translate Plato's Symposium, a dialogue which venerate, venerated sex, beauty and homosexuality as being passed to spiritual knowledge. The Romantic tradition then used pleasure and sexuality as instruments of dissent because they believed that these experiences formed a path to truth and the fullest expression of the human soul. Today's drab counterculturalists have narrowed this vision into a dogmatic form of narcissistic protest. They congratulate themselves with the conceit that by surrendering to self-indulgence and inventing multiple genders and victim groups, they are somehow using their shrill and unimaginative forms of self-expression to bring down dominant power structures. More often than not, however, these activists are merely turning themselves into products. They are missing the, well, the missing ingredient here is the soul. Authentic bohemian dissenters are driven not by a vision of political power, power but by an ideal human, of human transcendence. For genuine sexual revolutionaries, the significance of pleasure was not that it made politicians and conservatives feel squeamish, but that it emancipated people from industrial routine and guided individuals towards truth and the fulfilment of human potential. So there you go. That's my take on that. <clears throat> I uh, yeah, I don't know if there's anything else to add to that really. It just got me thinking that it's re- it's really it, well. The stuff about Plato is really the key issue there. That if we do believe, and it's not a given, obviously, but it's quite a um, powerful idea in, in the Western tradition that. There is a way of transmuting the pleasures of the soul, the pleasures of the body, in service of the progress of the soul. And by, if you don't like the word soul, think of human potential. If there's a way that you can harness your instinctual desires and the immediacy and power of our response to beauty, let's put it like that, whether it's erotic beauty or any beauty, but even in the most animalistic version of erotic love. If we can harness that madness and we can, and as Plato said, find a balance between reason and madness, um, then then we, then we are, then we can actually have a, a conscious relationship with our soul we can actually use it not for bad not be controlled by it not be enslaved to desires but actually use them as indicators 
towards beauty and, and beauty itself being an indicator of the divine, of something beyond, something transcendent, something beyond just the material. If we can see pleasure and beauty in that context, then it, can, then it has that power which Shelley and, and, and every Bohemian movement has actually allowed it to have. And, and it's proven, in, the proof is in the pudding there because these movements have created social advancement. And they have liberated people from constrictive ideas about what they're capable of. That, that is actually at best what happens when you find sexual freedom. Think of the feminist movement. The emancipation of women was very much related to their ability to, to have sex and, and, and pursue their own desires without fear of some horrible social fallout. The, the pill had sort of liberated that and then you get this movement of free love and, you know, it wasn't all perfect and it did go down the wrong path at some points, but there was a moment there where where women's liberation was aided by their, their ability to have far more control and, in a way, integrate their, their sexuality into their personalities in a way that they hadn't ever been able to do in human history. And in doing that, it, it created massive social progress. It emancipated the whole the half of the human race. So there's something in what Plato's saying. Uh, <clears throat> so that's my take on that. I don't know if there's anything else to add to it. Um, the way that we do this is another question, I guess. How do we do it? And I, and I talk about being having a sort of conscious and a self self-critical relationship with this pleasure principle. And I, and I suppose that my answer would be rather fluffily and romantically would be philosophy. I really that would be Plato's answer. Plato's answer was that if you, the, you if you insist on living the unexamined life, then you will be a slave to your senses and you will be controlled by pleasures and you will in in turn become a slave to algorithms or whatever it is, but in our world it's algorithms and, 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 and online porn or what you name whatever YouTube or whatever addiction it is that we have, Instagram. So the answer is to, <clears throat> to, to live philosophically and that doesn't mean dissent in the sense that it's become like just, you know, we're going to protest, man, it's like the 60s, yeah. No, that's not what I mean. That's not the examined life. The examined life is a life of contemplation. It's a life that understands that there's something beyond the merely material about human existence. That there's something, that human potential is the ultimate aim, that, that we are constantly evolving people, that, are, that we <clears throat> need not accept material constrictions as as. They are givens. It would be. It's and that's you know we're not Rousseauians, but we we need not accept them as final. That we that we can overcome ourselves. That we have the ability to to transcend our own self-imposed restrictions of who we are and who we ought to be. But it isn't done in some. In, in, but the, but, the, but this is the bit where it gets tricky. It can't be. This, I mean, in a, in a way, what all I've just said sounds exactly like the worst internet marketing and, and the worst Nike adverts, and this is the problem I'm trying to grapple with here. But the difference is in the soul, the idea of transcendence. One is not using these things to get more money or to, to feel happy in a kind of really low sense. It, it's to to grow. That's maybe the best way. The, 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 that there's something about human existence and our own personal potential as souls that's of intrinsic value that doesn't need Instagram or Nike. There's something about the pursuit of that in and of itself for its own sake. And that's really the, me the message of Socrates and Plato, that there's something non-materialistic, something non-prudential 
the, about human existence, and as long as we as long as we continue to chase after that, then we will not be manipulated by phony versions of this bohemianism. And it's a really difficult path to walk now with the word, and this is why I wanted to write this piece because we can. It's not a, it's not a matter of what it used to be, which is a bunch of fringe people like Plato and Socrates or Shelley urging us to, to, to really realise our fullest potential while everyone else is working in a factory or is working in, 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 in living in the suburbs. It's not like that. Now, everyone thinks that they're pursuing their own potential and everyone's being told all the time to, to, for, to, to enjoy self-expression and just free yourself, man. Be who you are, man. But the, the distinguishing feature here is transcendence, potential and soul. Most of what hipsterish bohemianism is about worldly power at the root of it. And it's not about contemplation, it's about fashion. The real difference is a, a kind of philosophic, platonic sense of self-reflection self and self-knowledge. I guess it comes down to the Socratic principle of he who is wise is no is he who knows he is not wise. The, the idea that you're never you've never arrived. You you're never fully you're never fully you know you've never fully <clears throat> um, got you know you can never f fully manifest your potential. The, 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 that and that's a huge difference between the advertising version of bohemianism and the, the true version of it. Is that the advertising version of bohemianism lies to you and says you there's definitely a, a point down the line where you can you can uh, find paradise and utopia it's a kind of utopianism of the soul whereas true soulful living understands that it's the kind of journey rather than the destination that you know we don't want to be I mean, this is all very difficult because every single thing that I could say here has been appropriate. It's like that Bill Hicks bit where he's, you know, oh, we've done a lot of research. A lot of people are feeling trapped. The trapped dollar, you know, like uh, the outrage dollar. Uh, it, it's a bit like that, isn't it? It just kind of goes in and out of itself. But the, the, I don't know. My answer is read Plato. <laughs> there you go. In summary, uh, he, 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 he got this down. The, the, the difference between the fake philosophy and sophistry which is, I would include um, the fake bohemianism in that. Uh, just trying to edit my piece here. You know when you, 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 you know it's awful, awful glaring, bloody typos. I spelled fucking Allen Gin, Alan Ginsberg wrong. That's embarrassing. Uh, what else did I spell wrong here? Quite a lot, I think. Uh, Oh, I don't know. Uh, I'll find it. Okay, anyway, fuck it. Uh, I think that's everything I've got to say today. I don't think... Um, I, don't, uh, I don't want to talk about stuff that's in the news. I could do. But... Um, yeah, I, I don't know. I'm... I, um, no, I'm not going to talk about the news because it's too depressing, isn't it? The only thing is that uh, where I am at is that the culture wars is just not the right frame to be having the discussions we're having. I've come off all my social media now, finally. Um, obviously, I'm still on YouTube if you count that as social media. <laughs> you say you're on social media, but we're still on YouTube. <laughs> what is this, a playground? Um... So, no, obviously I'm still having to partake in it, but I'm, I'm not, <clears throat> I'm not on the, I'm not addicted to the little, somebody likes you button, um, but, uh, and I'm just going to keep putting these podcasts up regardless, I'll be doing it till I die, I'll be doing it forever, um, until someone knocks me out, um, 
because why not? It's you know, at least I'll be able to say to myself, well, I did my best, I did my bit, I, I, I made my voice heard. I mean, it's the, having your voice heard is not the the ultimate aim. Anyway, when everyone's got their voice heard, <clears throat> it's it's finding a the silver bullet of impact that is the measure now of culture, and we're we're past the point where just raising your voice is enough because everyone's voice is raised, and this is the problem we're in. So I'm dealing with that question next. But that's it, and uh, thanks for listening. I'll speak to you next week.